Typically, business business people are more kind of interested in what they would get and how um, applicable it would be to their business rather than how you're doing it. So yeah, that was my my big learning in getting into other industries was to not talk like an actuary, I suppose, but talk in in their language of what they what they were trying to solve for. If you could introduce yourself, that'll be great. Sure. So my name is obviously Adam Drusi. Um, I'm an actuary based in uh, Australia. So um, I'm I'm 46. I've got a wife who's also an actuary. So we met at university back in Australia many years ago. We've got got two children, an 18 year old and a, and a 15 year old, 18 year old boy, 15 year old girl. Um, so I started my career in. Um, property and casualty, I guess, in a, in a US context, or, or general insurance, as we call it in Australia. So I started my career in general insurance consulting back in the day, um, what was that, 1996 or something, when I first started working. So I, I worked at a consulting firm, which is a great firm, and um, and back then I really enjoyed it because it felt like the newer area that actuaries were starting to get involved in. And I particularly enjoyed things like insurance pricing and that sort of work, rather than reserving work because I felt like it had more of an influence over future profitability rather than just measuring the past. So I kind of got interested in that stuff. And then, um, yeah, I guess over time, I was always interested in, in new areas and uh, eventually then started my own business, Spontium, with a with a co-founder and some other other people on day one. And uh, that was that was 18 years ago. So, yeah, I mean, obviously happy to talk about any of that journey that you like. But the, the idea of Quantium was it was to say, um, how could we apply all of these things that we were doing in insurance pricing, you know, with the idea of you're analysing customers and, and policyholders and, and trying to price for them individually, thinking, well, that same concept should be applicable in pretty much anything a business does where, they, where they've got customers trying to understand customers better and how you deal with those customers more individually. And so why was it that we're just insurance companies were looking at that? And so that was the, the idea 18 years ago. And today it's pretty obvious like today there's businesses everywhere doing that but 18 years ago it was a um funny enough it was a novel concept to to um think about that stuff actually it's interesting that back then insurance was at the forefront of this mm. yes and now things <laughs> maybe are a bit flipped on the head yeah I think, I think that's right actually i think um it, it was it was interesting like 18 years ago the conversation for me going to talk to a you know a, a telco or a uh, to be honest, we wouldn't have even spoken to a supermarket. Like, there would have been no point talking to a, a retailer. Um, but even to a bank and so on, we'd say, here's the techniques that insurance companies are using to be smarter about their pricing and how they think about individuals and all of this sort of stuff and how they use data and and you know, techniques to, to be smarter. And it really was back then trying to say to companies, we can take the smarts of insurance companies and apply them to your, to your sort of business, as you say. And, Whereas today, uh, that probably, you know, I think insurance companies have been left behind a little bit. And that's that's not a criticism of insurance companies. I think typically insurance companies actually have less data than a lot of other a lot of other types of businesses now. If you um, you know, back then I think insurance companies were always ahead of the game and thinking that well they was they were collecting data for a specific purpose, whether it was rating a risk or whatever it might have been. Whereas a lot of these other businesses were Kind of collecting data without really even thinking about it. it was just the nature of their business meant it generated a lot of data and particularly as the internet took over and then so we're trying to say to them given all of this data you could do amazing things with it and by the way insurance companies do a hell of a lot more with a fraction of the data so yeah whereas whereas today i think now that a lot of these companies they've got both the data and now applying the techniques to you know big business problems so i think there's now things insurers can learn from um from other businesses probably. Um, going back to Quantium, perhaps can you give a bit of an overview of your company? I think that perhaps a lot of the viewers wouldn't have heard of Quantium. Obviously I have, um, so yeah, that would be helpful. Yeah, no problem. So um, it's always a bit weird talking about your own company that you run, but that's, um, I'll, I'll, try, I'll do my best. Though. So when we started the business, um, 18 years ago, I guess we were very much um, a group of you know, group of actuaries. I think we had eight of us on day one and maybe um, three or four of us were actuaries um, and the others were kind of studying to be actuaries. So 
it you know it's, it was a very analytical feel if you like so we're our, our premise back then was simple it was really like a consulting company early on which was very much we've got some smart people who are analytically minded you know, happen to be actuaries we think we could help you with your data so so we almost the, the pitch to to say telco i remember pitching to a um when i say pitching a cold email back at, back in the day which you, you didn't get as many of them back 18 years ago was today that wouldn't work but cold email to a head of marketing at a, at a, a telco in australia and he took a meeting and said look i've never had someone come to me and say they want to use our data before and i've certainly never had an actuary kind of come and say that so i'm intrigued i'll take the meeting so that was yeah so you kind of it was it was kind of a bit like that right so whereas today if i fast forward now 18 years later um i guess we we do still employ a lot of a lot of actuaries but probably most of our actuaries now would think of themselves as data scientists rather than actuaries so we we employ a lot of people from actuarial degrees so as you know just here in australia we have um really good actuarial programs at university so we so we produce all of these great graduates uh, but a lot of them are not necessarily wanting to go and qualify as actuaries. Some of them, some of them do. Um, so we employ a, a, a lot of actuarial graduates. Some of them go on to to complete their exams, and some of them decide that they don't want to study anymore. And either way, they most of them pretty much do the same thing within quantum, which they work as a data scientist. And if I'm honest, most of them probably call themselves data scientists because it probably makes them worth more in the market these days than actuaries. Whereas Back in the day, that probably again, 18 years ago, that never would have been the case. You would have thought having the actuary thing on the resume was was um, valuable. Whereas I think now you've got so many companies thinking, "I want a data scientist. Where the hell do I find them?" So we've got people calling themselves actuaries and data scientists, depending on their qualifications. So it's a bit bit funny. So, but if I look at the team today, we've got we've got about I think it's about 800 people today, um, and within that, there's a there's a real mix of of capabilities and people. So we're first of all we're kind of got offices around the world. So we're we're headquartered in Sydney, and so we've got offices in in you know various parts of Australia. But we do have a few offices in the US. We've got an office in Chicago. We've got an office in in Bentonville, Arkansas. We've got an office in San Francisco, and then we've got offices in um, places like, like India, in Hyderabad, and in South Africa. Um, we just opened an office in London. So we've got offices in various parts of the world. So, we, so we're working with clients um, globally. We tend to work with 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 big companies with um, lots of data with big problems to solve. And so we work across uh, a variety of different industries that the, the, the major industries that we work in would be um, retail and fast moving consumer goods. So that's that's our, our two biggest industries. So within retail, you know, we're part owned by uh, Woolworths in Australia, which is the largest supermarket or largest largest retailer in Australia. So we're we're part owned by Woolworths. So we do a lot of work for for Woolworths in various aspects of their analytics. Uh, we've worked a lot with Walmart in the US, so they're they're a large client, uh, and we work with all pretty much all of the major fast moving consumer goods companies or or uh, consumer packaged good companies, depending how you call it. So that's companies like Coke, Unilever, Procter and Gamble. Um, Nestle, those sorts of companies. So pretty much anyone that supplies goods to uh, a grocery retailer in particular, we work with, with those companies. Uh, we do a lot of work in health and government. So as an example in Australia, uh, we do a lot of work with the Department of Health in Australia. So we're doing a lot of their COVID, COVID modelling for them over here. Um, so helping them understand data, helping the, the different um, state governments understand data to respond to um, the COVID situation. Um, and then we work with health insurers as well. So we've got a whole, whole range of work in health and government. We we do still do uh, a bunch of work in insurance, particularly in with property and casualty insurance. So some of the actuaries work in those areas are kind of doing more traditional type stuff, but still with a kind of data analytics feel to it. Uh, and then we do work in um, in banking, in um, kind of property. So we work with kind of shopping centre clients. We do work with clients like Qantas, who you'd probably be familiar with, or we, obviously you are, Jessica, but um, yeah, so so a large loyalty program associated with an airline. So yeah, so pretty much any any major industry which has got a lot of customers. So what, what we don't have is we don't do work in, in, in a sector like mining. So in Australia, mining is a pretty big sector, but we don't do mining work because they don't have individual customers. So we're not out there doing analytics to work out drill sites and so on, but we do work with you know, retailers where they've got a large loyalty program or they've got customers coming into their store every day making 
thousands of decisions in a store. You know, we help um, those sorts of companies. And then, and then in terms of the mix of people that we've got, I mentioned we've got about 800 people. Um, we, we divide our company up into kind of different teams. So we've got a, a product and technology team, which is probably about 250 people. And that comprises a bunch of people with different skill sets. So a lot of them will be um, engineers. So whether it's data engineers, computer science engineers, whatever, whatever they might be. Um, we do have a lot of a lot of actuaries in that team as well, and they're more in product analytics. And then we have, um, and then there'll be other specialists like um, uh, design specialists or whatever it might be, who can kind of think about how do you make a beautiful product for for a customer. So that we, if we if we're building a product for clients to use, they can actually get into the design elements of that uh, product managers and so on. So it's kind of like the full spectrum of capabilities there. And on the client side, when I mentioned all those verticals, we'll have a combination, again, of analytical folks, but also some industry specialists. So some people who really understand the property sector who can then work alongside data scientists who maybe don't have a deep expertise in property, but they do have a deep expertise in data and what you can do with, with information. So you kind of combine that industry knowledge with the technical kind of um, analytical skills to think, how can we solve a breakthrough breakthrough problem here? And so that team will be heavy on on um, analysts as well. So a lot of the actuarial graduates would work, uh, and actuarial actuaries would work in that part of the business. So the, the way I kind of think of it from an actuary point of view in those different parts of the business is um, they're, they're quite different skill sets and, and different interests that people have. And so we find that you've got, and it's, and it's really interesting finding the interests of different actuaries. Some, some actuaries are really interested in taking the conceptual problem and trying to solve it. So I think of that as going from like naught to 60 and solving a problem. So I've had to think about how would I even design the way to answer that? And how would I start building the analytics and so on? And maybe they're building a prototype or they're trying to build something that works now, but it doesn't have to work every second of every day all the time. And then sometimes that might turn into a product that actually does need to work kind of consistently. It needs to work 24 hours a day that you could have, you know, thousands of clients using. And in that case, it would usually pass off to a product team where the product team is almost building it to go from 60 to 100, if that makes sense, so that it, it actually is robust. And those actuaries tend to be interested in a, in a different thing. They're interested in how do you make a process as efficient as possible, that it never falls over, that it's as mathematically optimal as possible and so on. And so they're quite different skill sets. So we could have very technical actuaries go down different routes depending on what sort of problems they like to solve. So I, when I look at these kind of spaces, I think, um, you know, there's so many different roles that actuaries can play in, say, data analytics and anything mm -hmm. from conceptually solving problems through to kind of making something work all the time really, really well. Um, and um, it's interesting to me how, you know, I guess when I started my career, I never kind of thought about all of those different um, dimensions of what you could do. That was a great introduction. Adam, so many questions. Oh, okay. That's different. No worries. I think the first question is: I, I was, I've always been intrigued about how you managed to work in so many different industries, and I think you're saying that the commonality really is that these are industries that really, it's about having a lot of customers and a lot of data about your customers. Yes. Um. But still, I always thought that. I guess just thinking about my own career, right? I know I've built up so much knowledge about property and casualty insurance. It would be quite hard to switch industries. Mm. How have you found that switching into different industries? Yeah, it's it's funny, Jessica. Look, I think um, I guess when we started Quantium, uh, I'd heard a lot of actuaries talking about that, and they used to use the term wider fields. You know, work in wider fields and all this sort of stuff. And it did always sound very intimidating. The idea of going and having to pitch what you do to I guess a bunch of folks that have maybe never even heard the term actuary, if they have, they've got even um, misperceptions of what it might might involve and so on. Um, actually, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story that was the day that we decided to start Quantium. So I was with my now co-founder and we were going to pitch to a company. I, I won't say who it was because I, I'm not 100% sure I remember actually who the brand was, but it was a, it was a fast-moving consumer goods company. I think they were selling ice cream at the time or something like that. Anyway, we were going out there to pitch the idea of how you could use data and analytics to you know, do things better in their industry. And we, and we really understood very little about, about their industry and, and they understood very little about what actuaries did. And yeah, so we rock up to this meeting and, 
And the guy I was going with, my co-founder, Greg Schneider, he had amazing ideas. Like, I was blown away by the ideas he had for this meeting. They were so different to me anything I'd ever thought about in, you know, what I was doing every day in insurance pricing. Anyway, we, we pitched to this client or potential client, and it couldn't have gone any worse. Like, it was the worst <laughs> meeting I've had in my career. The guy actually said, um, I despise actuaries. <laughs> So I thought, how do I respond to that? So I said, oh, okay, that's that's a good start. I said, you know, why is that? And he said, well, you're probably going to tell me what I'm going to die of and then try and sell me insurance for it. And I said, well, that's not what actuaries do, but okay. Um, well, let's put that aside and why don't we talk about some ideas we got here because that's not what we're doing. Anyway, he was. you can imagine how close-minded he was. We never got anywhere in that particular case. But as we drove back from that meeting, I said to um, Greg, I said, you know what, we should do this as a business. I said, you got so many great ideas Forget that guy. Like that guy's just an idiot. We should we should have a crack at this, and um, and I guess if you if you if you think in you, you, even the way you described your own career, there you said you've got really deep experience in insurance, and you do, but you also have really deep experience in using data and thinking about analytics, and um, if maybe it's almost if you reframe and think, what are what are my skill sets? You've got a really deep skill set in being able to understand data and kind of love data in a lot of ways like in, in some ways the better the data the better you can solve a problem and you want the data to be clean and accurate and you know vo voluminous as much of it as you can get and then you've got a whole range of analytical techniques of how you can think about ways you might solve problems and all you've got to think of is okay now i'm just solving a different problem so it happens to be in your career not necessarily your case but some of you, the members they might have always been doing pricing or reserving but there was a first time they ever did pricing and they learned from someone else and some actuary did it for the first time. It's no different here. If you're going in and talking to, um, say, say, say a retailer. I'll, I'll give you an example. Talking to a retailer the other day, and they said something like, "When we have um, meat, they so they sell meat within the retailer, and so somebody has to go around as the meat starts going off in the store and put down stickers to say 15% off because he's only got two days left on the use by, on the." on the meat so they think well we want to sell it before we have to throw it away mm -hmm. and so how do you determine what is it 15 percent off is it 10 percent off is it 20 percent off and do you need to do it three days before the meat goes off or two days before the meat goes off and so on so it's kind of a pretty simple kind of business problem they've got in that case but it could lead to a lot of money because that because they don't want to be throwing away meat equally they don't want to be putting a 50 percent discount on there if it's going to sell with a 20 percent discount so something as simple as that might be kind of a really discreet piece you could give to someone and say, well, go away and try and solve how you might think about what the strategy should be so that you can actually then say, rather than say that the person whose job it is to put the stickers, because right now what it would be, it would be a store manager using their gut feel. They would be thinking, that meat's not selling, I'm going to put a sticker there and I'll put 15% off or whatever it might be. What it typically wouldn't be is that they actually have a set of rules as to what to do. Because there's just so many of those sorts of decisions. Whereas you could easily turn into rules that says, three days out from the meat not being sold, depending on how much other meat there is, you do X, Y, or Z. So that's an example of something where I was talking to the CEO of a retailer and he said, like, I feel like we should be able to use data to solve that better. And I'm like, yeah, easy. And so that's, that's a simple example. And then you can obviously get much more complex examples. Um, and so I guess, if in a simple example, it doesn't sound that intimidating when you talk about something, when someone says, this is my problem. I guess the harder thing is then getting to talk the language to actually be able to have the opportunity to have the conversation in the first place. And um, yeah, my advice on that one would be to not go in there and talk technical. So maybe again, if I share my own experience, we were working very early on with um, a company called Foxtel, who uh, is basically the cable TV or pay television operator in Australia. And I'll, I'll never forget, we, we were doing a piece of work which was around attrition. So we're trying to model, so that so they were kind of trying to quickly get subscribers to their platform, but a lot of the subscribers were, were leaving and that was costing them a lot of money. So they wanted to build a predictive model as to who was, who was likely to, to churn or to attract and then to try and think about strategies to keep them. So we were building that model. Anyway, so I, I, I mean, it was my job to present the findings to the client and the client was at the time, um, the head of marketing at, at this company and I was I did what I was trained to do as an actuary I think I think in the professional standards it's even said for something to be actuarial advice you have to 
produce the same amount of data to the client so they could reproduce, another actuary could reproduce your work, all of this stuff. Yes, yes, So yes, I'm going yes. in there and I'm, I'm trying to describe the work I'm doing, trying to say, here's what we did, here's this factor, here's this factor. And the guy interrupted me, and, and pardon my language here, but this is what he said. He said, um, sorry, I'm just interrupting. He said, we don't give a shit how you did it. Just tell us what we need to do. <laughs> and it was just that, it was a light bulb moment where I, I thought to myself, great, because I don't want to have to tell you everything we've done because all of that felt like a constraint. And actually, I did want to just have a business conversation about what they could do. And, and it was almost this team, that they, I could just see them looking and saying, we've got absolutely no idea how you're doing what you're doing with this, all this modelling and everything, but we believe you. But we just we just need to know the answers because we're desperate to to get the help. And we, we trust you that you know what you're doing with the modelling. And so at that point, it was great. And so it became then more a business conversation about what they could do with... Um, with the answers so so i think again then realizing then going forward if you're then pitching for work you don't, you don't want to go in and pitch for work and say here's how we're going to build an actuarial model you don't want to use actuarial terms throughout you're just trying to th think this is your business problem and this is what you need at the end to help solve it and you know this is how we'd go about doing it at a high level and that that worked now i must say 18 years later a lot of companies that do have much more kind of capabilities in terms of their own data science teams and so mm -hmm. on so yeah they might be interested in how you're doing it but typically business business people are more kind of interested in what they would get and how um applicable would be to their business rather than how you're doing it so yeah that was my my big learning in getting into other industries was to not talk like an actuary i suppose but talk in in their language of what they what they were trying to solve for Got it. That's super helpful. And obviously, it's becoming clear to me a lot of Australian business meetings. There's a lot of very frank language used there. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, I'm pretty bad because I swear too much. So I, I, I always swear in front of the team. I try not to, and and but it doesn't look like I'm trying not to because it looks like I'm swearing all the time. But I, I am trying not to. But but yeah, often you you get that with clients and. Um, and it, it is a bit different to to us because we do have uh, a bunch of US clients. So I do. I do think Australian uh, clients probably are a bit more direct and a bit more, you know, they might swear, but they're, they're not meaning any offence to it. And so, and and they probably, I think they just say what they think a bit more. And so I, I've actually found, again, um, I'll, I'll tell a story. So the, there was the former um, CEO of Walmart in North America was a, was a Kiwi guy, um, Greg Foran, wonderful, wonderful man and a fantastic retailer. And uh, I, I built up a relationship with him. So he, he was he was a Kiwi. He, he you know, anyway, what, however, I built up a relationship with him. And um, and I would find that when we would when we catch up one on one, we would just be quite direct with one another. He would ask me my opinion on things, and I would I would tell him what I thought. You know, and this didn't necessarily mean it was critical of anyone in his team. It wasn't. It was just talking about. He would ask an opinion. I would just freely give an answer. And then I remember someone saying to me, "Don't." underestimate how few people in the US would would do that given his role how few people would feel confident enough to just tell him what they think and disagree with him on points and so on he would be surrounded by people in business every day agreeing with him and telling him what they think he wants to hear and um, and I do notice that a bit more in um, in mark in, in the US probably there's a, there's a lot more of that people saying stuff and I think do they actually really think that or not and whereas I don't in Australia, and, and so you go to somewhere like South Africa and it's like Australia on steroids, yeah, there's like really robust meetings, but, but I love it because they're really innovative and they're really pushing the boundaries and they're really challenging each other and they're not taking offence to it. Like it, but if, but I think a lot of US people, if they went to some of these meetings, they think, oh gosh, that, that was, um, that was direct, but it's direct with, a, with the right intent. So yeah. And sometimes that means um, swearing. <laughs> yeah. Interesting cultural differences. Um, look, yeah, let me follow up on a few of the things that you said. Um, you know what? I, I read somewhere before that you have said that actuaries really have three skill sets, right? Technical, financial, and commercial, right? Mm. That's how you listed them. Mm -hmm. And I think what's obviously fairly evident in terms of your case is that you're extremely strong on the commercial side. Uh, yes. and, and that's probably an area where a lot of actuaries might be a little bit weak on. Mm. So any, I don't know if you can share how you really built up this skill set, but that, that could be helpful for some of our viewers. 
Yeah, um, it's, it's interesting you say that because I've kind of been thinking about that myself actually a little bit recently. Um, and I, I actually don't really know the answer. Um, I, I, what I can tell you is from a personal point of view, that's what I love the most. So, so I was, you know, I was a decent young technical actuary. You know, I did very well in my exams and all that sort of stuff. So I was technically I was very capable, but I was kind of never interested in it, right? So I started out, I was probably a pain in the butt as a, as an analyst with my peers because um, I, I kind of never really wanted to get into the statistical modeling and doing it myself. And whereas I know some people do, some people really love it. And we've got people in Quantium who are, um, that's what they really love specializing their time in, becoming really deep experts in techniques and stuff. And, and that's fantastic, right? So, so um, and they're brilliant. And I was just never interested in that. Even though mm -hmm. I could do it, I kind of, I didn't, as an example, coding. I didn't really want to do coding. And so I remember some of the other, like, you know, the, the analysts I was working with were kind of guiding me. They said, well, you, you have to do coding, mate. That's what you've got to do. You know, you, you code because I coded before you. So I kind of did what I had to do in the first couple of years. But then I quickly latched onto the other actuaries that were kind of doing the more more commercial side of it, whether it was presenting the results or thinking about the results and so on, I guess, in my early stage. And I was lucky enough that I probably started showing some skills there that I kind of then got more into that than, than coding. And I and I also, in my case, because I qualified quickly in our firm, it kind of meant that I was then getting to do different nature of the, of the job. So I was kind of doing less of the coding, more of the judgment side, even though I, you know, I still had less judgment than someone with more more experience. But so yeah, so I, I, I so I very quickly latched on the commercial side and was always interested in that. And um, and like I say, I guess that's why I was more interested in pricing than reserving because it was getting into that. And I was early on was working with like small insurers where you could actually sit there with the management and give them advice on what to do um, mm. rather than work, say, another actuary in a big company and so on. So, yeah, and, and I don't know, I guess I just track it back to even when I was a kid, I was kind of an entrepreneurial kid. I would I would sell stuff at school. I would be the book the bookie at school and all that sort of stuff. Like I was just, I was just like that. So I was just always interested in business without maybe thinking about it too much. And certainly then post, post that, like if I think about what I do now in my own role within Quantium, yeah, my strength is very much on like doing deals and, and mm -hmm. the commercial side and thinking commercially about the business as opposed to, you know, I, I, I haven't done any technical work for a client for well, pretty much in the whole history of Quantium actually. So I haven't done any technical work in 18 years, but I but I understand enough about what we can do to be able to sell it to a client or to be able to kind of think about what a deal could look like as a partnership with someone to go and do something. Yeah, so um, I don't know. So to, to answer your question, I think some of it for me was probably just that was innate and that was what I was interested in and and um, pretty good at. Some of it I learned from people I work with, but, but I do feel like... Um, more of that could be taught maybe in in some of the, the courses you do. I, I don't know. It's, it's yeah, how, how much can you teach some of these things? I, I actually don't know because I haven't I haven't spent too long thinking about it. But I I I, I think um, if you can think that broader commercial, then you can put yourselves in the shoes of these um, yeah you know, other industries, not just insurance companies. So yeah, I haven't answered that question very well. I don't know. <laughs> no. yeah. But I, I haven't. I haven't <laughs> I didn't but, mean no, you friends, haven't. I mean no, you have. I think that was my friends at Quantum that I've been friends with a long time. They call me a bush actuary because they say I don't do any real actuarial work. So they, they take the piss out of me like I'm not even an actuary anymore. But that's okay. <laughs> yeah. um, look, this is something we've been grappling with in the CAS because we would like, um, yeah, we would like to really instill more of that sort of business acumen, those commercial skills into all of our members. <laughs> But you're right. How do you teach something like that? Yeah, look, we, I mean, we even try within Quantium, right? We try and do the same thing where we um, we try and have sessions with, say, myself and the CFO might might try and run a session with our, you know, um, not necessarily just actuaries, but a bunch of our executives to try and say, here's how you should think about a deal and so on. And um, yeah, it's one of those things you kind of you can you can share what you you know as much as possible, but a, a lot of it probably is innate. Like to be honest, I find it very very easy. Like so, I find commercial thing on a deal just to be honest, I can't understand why other people don't find it easy because I find it so easy. But it's a bit like a lot of actuaries would find maths really easy, 
and it's a bit hard to understand how some people just can't grasp it. Whereas for most actuaries, maths is just something just innate. You just know how to do it. So for me, commercials is a bit the same. Like I don't, I don't really remember where I learned it. I can't say I studied this, I read that. I didn't do any of those things. I probably just picked it up by osmosis and enjoyed it and just naturally had a flair for it like maths. So it's, so it's a bit of a funny one. I'm sure there are things you can learn and there's some things that some people will be naturally more um, inclined towards it or not. But um, yeah, we, I wish I could just bottle it and say to everyone, at, certainly within Quantium, okay, here's, here's the six steps to take and maybe we should spend more time trying to do that. <laughs> not very good at that. No, and look, further on to that question though, it's, it's also looking at the literature online about you and your company. Um, it, it looks like you're able to actually really impact the bottom line for your customers, right? So when I look at the quotes that say Walmart have about you, they're very clear that you have managed to really produce results. Mm -hmm. And I think like I'm I'm a data scientist, right? I try to do this internally where I work. And yeah. I will say that in my experience, that's probably the hardest part, getting that last mile of yeah. people using what you have built to actually get results. So yes. how do you manage to uh, tackle that so successfully? Okay, so a few things there. So um, thank you, first of all, but I must say it's not it's not um, it's not always easy, as you say. So there's, there's a few things. I think, first of all, because um, because we're relying on third party clients engaging us to do a piece of work or to license a piece of software or whatever it might be, um, we almost have to be able to prove that up front because otherwise someone won't engage us. So unless we are talking in commercial terms and saying, this is what the benefit will be for you at the end of this project, then they won't engage us on a piece of work or license a product from us. So that, that can sometimes be a little bit different to internal teams. We're an internal team, you know, I, I don't know what it's like for you within your business, but you might sometimes think this is a problem we need to solve. And then you've got to try and convince other people internally that actually there's something there and they needed to solve it. Whereas for us, a client engaging us means that they've already taken that first step of thinking, I want to implement something at the back. So True. that's the first. So, so I think, so first of all, that means everyone within Quantum in our case, it's almost like every project that we do, they've had to be thinking about, well, what are we going to deliver at the end that will do that? So it's kind of, it forces you to do that thinking, which is helpful. Um, what I would say is we, we were, we're still not very good at it actually of being comfortable to say what a project delivered because I think actuaries in particular and and data scientists because a lot of you know in this talk I'm talking about actuaries but a lot of the time I just say data scientists because a lot of it's interchangeable I don't know within quantum necessarily who's an actuary and who's a data scientist because we're hiring the same sort of people with the same sort of capabilities it just happens to be that some of them have done actuarial degrees right um, but typically they are conservative and they don't like to um kind of have rough estimates of value delivered so whereas other business people so you, you might have a business person say well i delivered 500 million dollars worth of value on that project and you say well how did you come up with that and they show you their analysis and you could fit it on the size of your mobile phone like it's you know it's it's some tiny bit of analysis of four numbers multiplied by each other whereas if i took a data scientist or an actuary and said show me the value that delivered they'd really want to have really solid evidence and proof of what they've delivered so i think sometimes um, data scientists and actuaries sell themselves short because they're so mm -hmm. reluctant to take credit that they then don't put a number out there. And so we've had some clients where they've kind of really said, look, we actually have to find a number here because, you know, it's not just for you guys, but we need to be able to show the CEO what we've done on this project. And so we've had to get out of our comfort zone a little bit about being able to measure these things as exactly as we'd like to. So I think that's, that's probably my biggest advice would be uh, to people to get out of their comfort zone to kind of have a go at estimating what value has been created. And then and then in our case, working with our client, or in your case, it might be working with other internal stakeholders who frankly might have just as much interest in you in trying to, to show that benefit. Um, as long as it's not getting to the point where you, know, you then present it to the CEO and the CEO says, well, that's fabulous, but I don't see that actually on the bottom line. I don't, you know, my bottom line's the same as what it was last year. So, you know, it's great that you think you've delivered Hundred million dollars worth of value, but I can't see it. You, know, you, you can't get to the point where you're making stuff up together. But, but I think, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say for us, it's being commercially minded from the very start of a, of a project and being aligned with other stakeholders and that, and then actually just being willing to try and measure it. And we're still we're still working pretty hard mm -hmm. on the second year. I think we're still um, 
got lots of examples where we need to do better at you know, at, um, at estimating that that impact. Got it. Is that your advice then to actually just always try to measure it? Is it something you yeah. try to do regardless of whether a customer needs it or not? Well, we do now. We do. We do now. Um, so I'm I'm constantly pushing it, but I, I assure you, it's not happening on every project we do within Quantum. I, I guarantee you that. But but I'm I'm certainly um, encouraging and pushing it. But that would be my advice. My advice would be that you t to take the time to try and estimate it together, and then and just be mindful the whole way through of what it is. So ideally for us, what we want to do is we want to say. Let's design a project and let's be clear on what our objectives are. And let's and first of all, let's be really clear on what we're trying to achieve. Because what you don't want is that you get to the end of a project, you think you've done an amazing job, and the stakeholders go, well, I thought it was going to be even more amazing. So be, be clear up front, yeah. it's like a joint business plan to say, look, we think we can achieve this. And if, the, if we achieve this, would this be a great result? Let's align on that. And they say, yes, sir. You know, the terms we've been using in terms is like, what does great look like? So agree on what great looks like up front. And then consistently try and measure it along the way. So that by the time you get to the end, you say, "Well, we got there, and not only did we achieve great, but we achieved great plus 20%." So that's the mindset we're trying to introduce more in our business. Um, and I and I think that could apply to to anyone, whether you're in an internal role or um, or working with third parties. No, that's that's great. Look, I'm going to get my team to watch this because this is what I ask them to do too. <laughs> It's not, easy, no, it's, it's, no, it's yeah. not easy. Um, it's not easy. Um, so that's that's very helpful. Um, look, another question I have then, uh, you know, talking about Walmart and companies like that. Why are they hire? I mean, I hope you don't mind me asking. Why are they uh, hiring? Because they must have teams of data scientists in house. Yeah. So clearly, you're yeah. bringing something else to the table. Yeah, that's a common question we get asked. Um, so, so not sp speaking specifically about any one client, but just in general, like because you're talking about lots of different clients here. Um, look, I think I think there's a few reasons. I think um, one, we do, like I said, I'm not, I'm not sp speaking about any client specifically here, but we, first of all, we've got experience. So I guess having been doing this sort of work for 18 years in our case, that is a lot of experience. So we've got you know 800 people and 18 years experience. Now obviously all 800 haven't been there for 18 years, but that's we've kind of solved a lot of different problems and different iterations over time. And so we're mm -hmm. kind of confident using whatever tech technology or type of data or tools or whatever it might be. We're kind of pretty used to seeing it all now. And so that's so that's one thing. Um, and so we just have experience solving a whole range of different problems. And often. It might be that something you've solved in one industry could be applied to another industry. Um, secondly, I do think a lot of internal teams around the place are too academic. You know, I've seen um, some internal teams where, you know, the head data scientist seems more concerned about uh, publishing papers than actually achieving results. And, they, and sometimes they are too splintered off and they are seen as the technical boffins in another part of the business rather than working with the business. And it's a really difficult thing to work out how do I structure a team like this? Do I have them sitting separate to the business or within the business? And that's there's, there's no easy answer to that. Um, so I think often what you know we would typically be engaged by the business, and that's because we probably come in and try and talk to them like business people. This is your problem. We can solve it. We're not talking about techniques. We're not talking about um, academic stuff. We're talking about business results, and so that will appeal sometimes. Uh, and sometimes we do. I, I do think we have deeper analytical skills than some some teams. So some teams, yeah, they might have, you know, they might first of all be really struggling to hire data scientists. So some of our clients, particularly, um, in, you know, in certain industries, it, it's really difficult for them to hire someone. You know, there's a real shortage of data scientists, you know, as, you, as you'd be aware, and it might be difficult for some of these companies to even hire one, let alone hire a team of six that's needed to solve a particular problem. So, so there's a variety of different reasons, and some of the, the bigger clients, it might be because, you know, even though they've got a big team, they're still massively short of what they need, uh, or there might be business problems they've never tried to solve before. Because um, I think, you know, you mentioned you mentioned Walmart, but an industry like retail, as an example, I think we're still scratching the surface of what analytics can do to to, to transform a retailer. Really? There's just so many things. Oh, there's just so many. I mean, you you think about walking into a into a a grocery retailer there are so many decisions there that the retailer has to make um, that 
that can data can be used to inform everything from. So let, let's just think about it really simply, right? You walk you walk into a store. So first of all, how do you lay out the store? So that's a that's a data that's a data challenge. Um, how do you how do you make sure the, the the stocks are shelved? How do you know when the stocks are actually empty? And how do you get stuff delivered from trucks efficiently from warehouse distribution centres to stores? Kind of predicting that you're going to run out of things on the shelf. How do you price every product such that you're both optimising price within a category, but then you're optimising the basket of the customer who walks out and is going to compare Walmart with Kroger as an example. How do you how do you do your marketing and promotions uh, in the first place to attract customers to go to, to your store? And that might be everything from the mix of above the line media you use through to below the line offers for individual customers through a Lord's program. And then stuff like within the store, how much of the store should be soft drink? So you, you've got a certain size footprint. How much of the store should be soft, soft drink? And within that, how much of it should be Coke versus lemonade versus um, mi mineral water, and then should you put Coke next to Diet Coke next to Coke no sugar, or should you put Coke next to Pepsi? Like all of these things, and, and where should you locate? Should you put a certain product on the top shelf or the bottom shelf? All of these different things, every single one of them are things that data can be used to, to help answer, let alone then the shopping experience. So how can you make it so that, so in Australia, um, We've done some work with Woolworths uh, with a thing called Scan and Go. So as you're walking through the store, you scan the products yourself. So you need to be a member of the Lord's program. You scan the product yourself and then you, you walk out the store. Hmm. But when you walk out the store, they do spot check sometimes on people to make sure that they've scanned properly. So as an example, we've built the algorithms to work out who you should spot check because likely that person might have stolen something or underscanned accidentally, shall we say. Um, because you know we, we can look at things like how long were they in the store, what did they buy versus what we would typically expect that customer to buy, et cetera, based on their buying history. Mm -hmm. We say, well, given that store, customers in the store for 29 minutes, the algorithm predicts that they haven't scanned enough items in their basket, you should check it. So things like that. So that's, again, another use of data and analytics. Um, so, so you think about a retail, there's just unlimited stores. I gave the other example before of, you know, how do you mark down products like meat or other perishables and so on. Um, and, and, and simple things, I'll, I'll give you an example of a big project we're doing in retail at the moment in Australia, which is then all of that I just talked about was for one store. How do you then personalise stores? So if you've got if you've got a thousand stores across the country, should they all be the same or should they all be, be different? Should they have a different mix of products store by store? And I, and I think common sense would say, well, actually, the customers going to those stores are probably quite different. The demographics of every store are different. So you would think they should be quite different, but typically they aren't that different. Typically, they're, they're pretty similar um, or very similar. And that's because of the supply chain. It's a real challenge to get to get it all different. So so we're doing a, a really big, big project at the moment uh, with Woolworths in Australia, which is around a thing called range localization, which is trying to say, how do you localise what's in each store to be different based on the customers coming into that store? And again, you've got all of the customer, you know, from all the customer data, we know the customer's going to the store. So, you know, it's, it's actually, um, it's quite feasible to actually then do the analytics to say, well, actually, it should be a different mix of cheeses in this store versus another store. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's an example of a big project where I think if we can get it right, and so far um, the indications are that, you know, we can that that can have that can have a dramatic impact on sales for a retailer if they can start saying, well, actually, I'm going to go to that store locally because it's got what I what I want, which might be different to what customers in another suburb want. So huge uh, possibility still. That's awesome. Um, and yeah, I think what's really apparent is how much how much data is really generated when you have a lot of touch points with your customer, right? Which is so different from insurance. Well, that was what I was saying before when we were talking about the different industries. Like you think about, um, again, you think about retail. Sorry to harp on about retail, but I uh, could talk about other industries as well. But when you think about something like that retail, it just a simp something as simple as going in and, and buying your um, your groceries of a week, that that basket of items tells you so much. This, you know, for a start, there might be 50 items in there, but also you've made decisions around price because you might have chosen an item which was different to what you chose last week because it was on special. So all of these different things you've got, you've got customers are making all these different price decisions every week. They're making ranging decisions. <clears throat> they're making 
all sorts of decisions which re reveal a lot about them but also their behaviors and so you kind of and you're getting that probably these days on average about twice a week a customer would go into a, a store like that and so you just got this constant constant data whereas a, an insurance company might you know, insure you at the start of the year, they ask you a series of rating factor questions and, you know, ideally they don't have a claim and, this, you know, let's do it again next year. So it's, the volumes of data are, are dramatically different. And then you think about something like a telco, you know, a telco just has constant, you know, constant data being generated. Um, so, you know, they've got the opposite problem. It's got so much data, they, they've got to think about carefully how they, how they use it. Great. No, thank you so much, Adam. This has been, Fantastic. <laughs> um, no I don't know if, if you have any, uh, you know, last words or thoughts that you wanted to share with the CAS audience. Uh, look, I guess I guess if you if you're the sort of person that's interested in um, in the sorts of things we're talking about here and, and bigger problems, I guess I guess my advice would be um, to not be intimidated by it. Like it. it Probably, I, I guess as I as I reflect you know, in this conversation early in my career, it sounded intimidating the idea of going and working in wider fields. And that was just because everyone talked about us that was intimidating. You know, actuaries in wider fields. Whereas I, I think just forget wider fields and forget the fact that you you might have started working in insurance, but think about uh, and that might be hard if you've got thirty years of insurance experience. I get it, but particularly like these young actuarial graduates we employ. Trust me, that they hit the ground running and do phenomenal things so quickly. Um, they just needed the opportunity to kind of get in there and have a crack, do you know what I mean? And so I've got no doubt that actuaries and people with that sort of capability have huge capacity to, to deliver value across a range of industries. I, I, I see it in our business I, and I see it in clients all around the place of what could be done. So there's, uh, there's, there's an unlimited number of questions that there could be answered with data and analytics. And I think actuaries have the ideal skill set in in using large amounts of data and in, and in solving things with analytics. I think the main thing they just need to adjust is the kind of communication to be have the confidence to go in there and 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 have a crack. Um, and it's not as intimidating as it necessarily has to sound. And I think the only way you find that out is to is to try and so maybe, maybe even with an insurance company it might be trying to um, look at something that maybe isn't normally in your area. So it might be looking at call center optimization or whatever whatever it might be. Maybe it's something that's a little bit different to just doing uh, the pricing that maybe you've traditionally worked. You know, you, you, the team could go out and put their hand up for other other sorts of problems. But um, I guess, as I say, you've got the skill set to do it. You just need the, the confidence in a lot of people, I think. Got it. No, thank you for that. Very inspiring. No problems. Okay. No problems at all. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah.